welcome to Essential 100, our journey during 2023 through the message of the Bible in a hundred readings. Our readings are taken from Whitney T. Cunningham's book Essential 100, published by Scripture Union. Each week we have a reading from the Old Testament and one from the New to help us reflect on the message of the Bible, God's love for us in Jesus Christ. Today we're encouraged to read Exodus chapters 1 and 2. You might wish to read through the whole passage today, as well as listen to these few verses from it now. But first, an opening prayer for today from the book. It's so good to be still with you, Father God. Help me to set aside all the distractions in my heart and mind as I come to you now. My reading is from Exodus chapter 1. I'm going to be reading verses 6 to 17 and then verse 22. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and, if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labour, and they built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labour in brick and mortar, and with all kinds of work in the fields, In all their harsh labour, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipha and Puah, When you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God, and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. The scene is set, and chapter 2 introduces us to Moses, documenting his early life, the story we have probably all known since childhood. The Bible tells us that the Egyptian princess realises that the baby she finds is probably a Hebrew, but still takes him in to raise as her own. I wonder if she guessed that the woman she employed as his wet nurse was actually his mother. That would show her to be a woman of great compassion and kindness despite the cruelty her father was inflicting on the Hebrew slaves. As with Joseph before him, we see God's hand on the one he has chosen for a special purpose, keeping Moses safe even in adverse circumstances. Much of what follows is quoted from the book by Whitney T. Cunningham. In his introduction to the study of Moses' life, he remarks, For the first 40 years of his life, Moses was part of the rich and famous of Egypt. Then he blew it all by losing his temper and spent the next 40 years living with his in-laws, tending sheep. We're told that the name Moses sounds like the Hebrew word for draws out, and Whitney observes that the baby who was drawn out of the river by a princess would many years later, draw the Hebrew people out of oppression and slavery. 
Today, our names usually don't have the same level of significance, but it's still valuable to consider our origins. So he asks us, what kind of family were you born into? How did your early years shape your character? Moses, he says, would have died in obscurity if it wasn't for one thing. He had an encounter with God that changed everything. We'll be hearing more about that on Thursday. I wonder what would have happened to Moses if he had grown up without knowing he was a Hebrew by birth. Would he have cared about the cruelty he witnessed towards this alien tribe? How was he made aware of his roots? Did the princess or one of her household tell him? Did his mother remain with him into boyhood? Or did his looks give it away? However he knew, it caused him to harbour an anger that burst out with fatal consequences for an Egyptian slave master. If instead he had prayed and trusted God, would he have remained in the palace, innocent of murder, until God called him to lead his people out of slavery? Or did he need to taste fear, desperation and obscurity to become the man God could trust with a great and dangerous task? Whilst I don't think that any of us is a murderer, I'm sure there have been times when we have said or done something rash in the heat of the moment, something we deeply regretted, perhaps something, as with Adam and Eve, that caused us to try and hide from God. Last Sunday, Richard reminded us that there is no place or time where God is absent from our side. Whether we want him or not, he is with us, so we may as well turn our attention back to him, where we, where we receive forgiveness, grace, renewed hope, joy and courage. In that place of renewal, we can rediscover his call on our life and live purposefully again. Whitney ends with two more questions. How have the difficulties in your life prepared you to serve God better? How would you describe your mission in life? And a final prayer. Dear God, open my eyes to the things you are doing in my life. I want to be all you want me to be even if that means there are some things I need to change. Amen.